and welcome back to another episode of the Underworld Diary. On today's episode we will be taking a look into one of the craziest and toughest gangsters to ever live, Joey Crazy Joe Gallo. Growing up in the heyday of the mob, Gallo was quick to resort to violence and quickly built a reputation for himself throughout New York. Starting multiple mafia wars and being tied to two of the biggest mafia hits of all time, Joey made a short but long-lasting legacy in organized crime history. The definition of a gangster Joey lived a life where he did what he wanted and didn't bow down to anyone. This mentality is what is said to lead to his eventual downfall, with his defiance of authority having tragic consequences. Joseph Gallo was born and raised in Red Hook, Brooklyn, New York in 1929 with two brothers Albert and Larry. Joe's father was a well-known bootlegger during the days of Prohibition and was said to continue living a life outside the law after Prohibition ended. It's said that Joe's father developed a loan sharking operation with his proceeds from bootlegging and was quick to get his sons involved in the family business, growing up primarily in the Kensington section of the borough Joe Wood. Attend primary school in Kensington before going to Brooklyn High School of Automotive Trade. During this high school period, Joe would begin to get into fights and was said to struggle in school. By the age of 16 Joe had enough of school and dropped out, moving full-time into the streets. Still working alongside his father with his loan shark operation Joe would be, known for his short temper and toughness throughout his neighborhood. His fearsome and unhinged demeanor would be emphasized after getting into a car accident in the late 40s which left him with a nervous tick. In 1950 alongside his brothers, Joe Gallo would be arrested for the first time. It was here, in his short time in jail, where Gallo would speak with a prison doctor, who diagnosed the young 21-year-old Gallo with schizophrenia. With little known about this disorder at the time, not much was done to intervene and help Joe with this disorder. However, this diagnosis and rest didn't slow Joe down as after being released he and his brothers would go right back into the streets finding any way they could to make some extra cash. Seeing this young tough kid, members of the, then named, Profaci family were quick to recruit the young Gallo boys to their family. Joe, taking to this new role, immediately climbed the ranks and became a well-known enforcer for the Profaci family. Carrying out assaults, extortion and running gambling rings, Joe was able to start to make some real cash for himself. Buying an apartment on President Street in Brooklyn, Joe would begin to expand his business by investing in nightclubs and sweatshops throughout the area. Continuing to grow his reach Joe was put to the test to see how committed he truly was to the life. Now before we get into this part of the story, Joe's involvement in this is alleged and has not been proven to this day. His alleged involvement comes from multiple informants and people associated with the mafia at the time. With that being said it is alleged that in 1957 Carlo Gambino the then underboss of the Anastasia crime family, came to Profaci for help in taking out the boss of his family Albert Anastasia. Anastasia at the time had a reputation as the most feared man in New York, with around a hundred murders connected back to him, Anastasia ruled by fear. Being the head of an organization called Murder Inc., no one thought of moving against him with fear of brutal retaliation. This is why it came as a surprise when Carlo Gambino came to Profaci to carry out this hit, and even more surprising when Profaci accepted this hit. Allegedly giving this hit to Joe Gallo to complete, Joe gathered a crew and began to plot his next moves. Seemingly unbothered by the status and reputation of the man Joe was asked to take care of, Joe quickly set his plan into motion. As in October of that year, Anastasia would enter his barber shop in Midtown Manhattan to get a fresh shave. Relaxing in the chair with a towel around his face, Anastasia was interrupted by a group of men with their faces covered, barging into the barber shop. Opening fire on Anastasia immediately, confused and hurt Anastasia lunged at the mirror thinking it was his attackers. The shooters continued firing until Anastasia slumped to the floor. Quickly fleeing the scene, the gunmen were able to escape and to this day have not been conclusively identified. In 1958 after allegedly being involved in the murder of the most feared mob boss of the time, Gallo was summoned to testify in front of the U.S. Senate McClellan Committee on Organized Crime. The always cool tough talking Gallo would show up to the stand wearing sunglasses, with slit backed hair cracking jokes. Refusing to answer any question thrown at him, the testimony did little to help the Senate. However, with clips and pictures of Gallo's testimony circling round, his brash demeanor and gangster image gave him publicity across America adding to his notoriety. Proving his commitment to the family, with his testimony, or lack thereof, 
and alleged involvement in the Anastasia hit, Joe felt he should have a bigger position in the family. In 1961 this came to a breaking point as Joe Gallo and his crew felt that the financial reward they were receiving wasn't enough. Growing more and more frustrated, Gallo devised a plan to kidnap the leadership of the Profaci family and hold them for ransom. Quickly implementing this plan in February of that year Gallo and his crew kidnapped. Underboss Joseph Magliocco, Joe Profasis' brother Frank Profaci, Capo Sal of Tor Musacchia and soldier John Simone. Enable to capture Joe Perfacci himself the crew held onto the four other hostages. The Gallows demanded a more favorable financial split from Profaci and $100,000 upfront in exchange for his men back. Gallo, wanting to demonstrate their seriousness, wanted to kill one of the hostages to send a message, but was told no by his older brother. With negotiation going on for a week, the Gallows and Profaci finally came to a deal and the hostages were released. However, Profaci had no intention of keeping his promise to end with. Help from the administration of his family immediately went to seek vengeance on the Gallo crew. He did this by first bribing Carmen Persico to switch his allegiances from the Gallos to him in order to catch the Gallos off guard. Then the first shot was fired in this war when Joseph Gioli, a Gallo enforcer, was shot and killed by the Profaci family. This was seen as a declaration of war and saw the Gallos retreat to Joe's apartment on President Street where they would hide out as the war waged on. In August of that year, Larry Gallo was called to a meeting at Sahara Lounge by his thought-to-be ally Carmen Persico. Once arriving Carmen and a Profaci family member would attack Larry and attempt to strangle him to death. Luckily for Larry a police officer happened to walk by and noticed this assault and quickly broke it up. This incident is said to be where Carmen Persico picked up his nickname the Snake. Hiding out in his apartment Joe and his crew were unable to make their usual collections and began running low on money. In order to get some cash to live off Joe went to a local cafe and tried to extort the owner. The owner immediately told the police and Joe was quickly arrested. Being convicted of conspiracy and extortion in December of that year, Joe was sentenced to 14 years in prison, of which he served 10. Being shipped off to prison Gallo would be moved to three different prisons throughout his sentence. The first being the Green Haven Correctional Facility, the second, being the Attica Correctional Facility and the third and final being the Auburn Correctional Facility. During his time in prison, it is said that Joe Gallo would develop strong ties with African-American inmates and would become closely associated with drug trafficker Nicky Barnes, with the two notorious criminals exchanging information with one another. Gallo saw an opportunity for the Mafia and African-American gangs to join forces. At this time Gallo would recruit African-American gang members to his crew creating an alliance that could benefit the both of them once released from jail. This, however, was not viewed favorably by the old-school Italians that were locked up at the same time, and was said to cause strain between them and Gallo throughout his sentence. After moving to Auburn prison it was said that Gallo began to spend his time painting and pursuing art to pass the time. Some correctional officers at the time would praise his artistic abilities and claim that Gallo was a talented artist. While serving his time the Profaci and Gallo's own family would experience some change. As in the years of his imprisonment, Profaci would pass away with his underboss Magliocco taking control of the family. However, this would be short-lived as later that year Magliocco would be exiled from the Mafia. After conspiring to carry out a hit on the other bosses on the commission, this resulted in Joe Colombo taking over the family and becoming the boss. Joe would hold this position for the remainder of Gallo's prison sentence, however, before he was able to get out of prison and meet the new boss. He had to deal with the unfortunate news that his brother Larry died of cancer in 1968. This of course crushed Joe, as he lost his brother, but he also lost the only person that could keep him in check as well. In 1971 three years after his brother's death Joe was finally released from prison. Upon being released the new head of the family, Joe Colombo, wanted to set up a sit-down with the newly released Gallo and establish some sort of peace between the two. Colombo offered Gallo $1,000 as a welcome home gift, to which Gallo angrily rejected. Seeing this offer as disrespectful for all the time and work he put in for the family, stating that he did not agree to any sort of peace treaty and demanded the boss pay him $100,000 to end this conflict. Joe Colombo, not viewing Gallo as a threat, rejected this, kicking Joe Gallo out of the meeting. Enraged, Gallo left and went back to his apartment and prepared for round two of the war. After Gallo left the meeting, Colombo discussed the conflict with his administration. Seeing the potential of the war reigniting, the administration decided that a hit should be placed on Gallo's head. 
Once again Joe Gallo's involvement in this hit is alleged and has not been proven to this day. However, in June 1971, during his second annual Italian League rally, boss Joe Colombo was shot three times by a lone gunman. Joe survived the attack but was paralyzed and remained that way until his death in 1978. The gunman was later determined to be Germoni Johnson, who was immediately killed by a Colombo bodyguard following his attack. With the recent argument with Colombo, the fact that the shooter was African-American, and Joe's ties to African-American gangs, suspicion from both law enforcement and mafia members fell in Joe Gallo. Many seeing this brazen attack, felt that only Joe would be crazy enough to order a hit in such a public setting. The shocking shooting of the powerful boss led to people in the family immediately looking for revenge, trying to confirm their suspicion in tandem with the police investigation. The members were not convinced. After an investigation done by the police concluded that the shooter acted alone and was not connected to organized crime. Ignoring this investigation many in the family still believe the shooting was Joey's doing. However there are other theories that members of other mafia families, including Carlo Gambino ordered the hit on Colombo due to the publicity he was bringing to the mafia, and Joe was used as a scapegoat for them. These are all speculative in Joe's involvement, if any, in this brazen shooting is all alleged. After the Colombo shooting, the remaining Administration wanted to get revenge on the suspected shot color Joe Gallo. This came to a head on the night of April 1972. On that night Joe Gallo entered Umberto's clam house at 4.30 a.m. He came to the restaurant with his wife, his sister, her daughter and his bodyguard Peter Pete the Greek Diapoulis. Getting seated at a table in the back of the restaurant, Joe did not notice at the bar of the restaurant a Colombo associate. Seeing Joe enter the bar the Colombo associate quickly left and informed the heads of the Colombo family that he saw Joe was at this restaurant. With this information members of the Colombo family were sent to the restaurant immediately. At the table with his friends and family Joe was interrupted when four gunmen came rushing in and opened fire on Gallo and his bodyguard. Gallo tried to draw his gun but was hit by a sea of bullets, his bodyguard being hit in the crossfire dove for cover. Joe Gallo being badly wounded staggered to the front door where collapsed on the street. Gallo was rushed to the hospital where he passed away in the emergency department. Joe Gallo, like many mobsters at the time, was born into the life. With a father running a loan sharking operation and being a former bootlegger Joe was introduced to life outside the law at a young age. Growing up in this environment with his brothers and friends all influencing him to take up a life in the street, Joe was slowly dragged in deeper and deeper. Despite suffering from serious mental health conditions Joe was able to rise in the mafia and build a strong crew. Not willing to listen to any authority he had constant conflict with the heads of organized crime and law enforcement throughout his life. Living as a true outlaw in his alleged ties to major mafia hits, Joe lived a fast life that was cut short by these same decisions. Thank you for watching another episode of Thunderworld Diary. If you like the content covered on this channel hit the like and subscribe down below. If you have any topic you'd like covered in future episodes feel free to leave a comment. If not I'll see you next episode with another story from the underworld.